blame it on the cold. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Um, we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week and it is posted afterwards. And I will show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archived recordings. Both the live show and the archives are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, on our archives, we do include both the recording of the show and any presentations or handouts or anything that's included. So, for example, for today, you will have a link to these slides um, and also has a handout that we'll talk about later, too, that you'll have access to. So you have everything you need to watch it afterwards. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live. Um, the Nebraska Library Commission, for those of you who are not from Nebraska, is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska. And this is for all libraries, um, all types, schools, K-12, academic, uh, public, uh, correctional, museums, anything that's a library, we are the um, support agency for them. So you'll find things on our shows and in our archives that will run the gamut of anything you could possibly think of. Really, our only criteria is that it is something to do with libraries. Something libraries are doing, something they think they should be doing, um, uh, product demos, uh, book review sessions, mini training sessions, um, we're all over the place. <laughs> but it's great. <laughs> it's all for libraries. Um, we do uh, bring in guest speakers to come in and talk about different topics from um, around Nebraska and around the country. Um, but we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations. And that's what we have this morning. With me today is Amanda Sweet, who is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And um, she's luckily here with us this morning. She's been a little under the weather <laughs> over the weekend. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, so many people have been going through it, but she's here, she's got her tea, um, yeah. and she is going to answer the, the, the very important question, what in the world is emerging technology? <laughs> That's the idea. I know more than I did before. Yes, <laughs> and this is actually um, the first of a two-part series, I guess yeah. we'll talk. Let's say that Amanda is doing um, today. We're doing what in the world is emerging technology, and then in a month on March 13th, she's got a follow-up session that goes along with this, um, the ethics behind emerging technology. So, you'll, um, if you're interested in learning more about that, you make sure you sign up for that one as well. It's available on our website right now for you to register for. But I will hand it over to you, um, Amanda, to um, answer your questions. Sounds what is it? <laughs> yeah. All right, so as you can see on the screen, I'm the technology innovation librarian, and one of my job duties is to track emerging technology trends. So probably one of the first and most frequent questions I get is what in the world is emerging <laughs> technology? Mm -hmm. And really there is no across-the-board standard definition. Emerging technology is emerging because, one, we're still defining it, the creators are still defining it, and as people are creating tech new technology, we have to figure out how it fits in our lives, how it fits in our field, how it fits in everywhere. It's not just in libraries, yeah. Yeah, and that's why the first thing that I'm going to do is talk about what emerging technology is in the world overall. I cannot, will not, and can never claim to know all there is about emerging technology because there's just, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be more. Yeah. I mean, right now there's probably things being invented that are not going to be in this presentation. I have a chart. But, <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. But we'll be in tomorrow, a version of this that you do tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
So I'm going to go over one, what it is. I'll go over a few examples of where it lands in different industries, because once a general concept of emerging technology shows up in one industry, then over time people start to look at that and find different applications for it. So I'm not going to go over specific types of emerging technology. I'm going to go over different concepts. So they're just going to be umbrella terms that can be used across the board. And there will not be a specific definition for each one of these things because one, we're still defining it. Mm -hmm. And two, as you create definition changes, and we can get a little more into that as we dive into some examples. And then I'll go into what can be currently and actively used in the library right now and some different ways that we're researching technology to be used in the library in the future. And those are techniques that will likely happen, but who's to say? <laughs> and then what we can do to use the information from this presentation to help identify the needs of our patrons in the future, because technology is changing everything right now. Oh, yeah. All right, so first off, I'm going to start with some different ways to identify what emerging technology is. As I said before, there is no one standard definition. So I read a whole lot of journal articles. I read a whole lot of anecdotal information. And then just the consensus across the board is we don't know. We're still defining it. But there have been more recently, there have been more research studies to collect, to do general studies to find out defining characteristics. Mm -hmm. So these are just broad overarching criteria that we can use to find out if technology is advanced enough to have crossed out of emerging and into broad use. Everybody's on board with it and is using it. It's right. no longer the new thing in town. Right. And the big thing is that's going to change industry from industry. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go over blockchain in a little bit. And blockchain is used in the financial industry a lot because it started with Bitcoin mm -hmm. and cryptocurrencies. But now they're looking at it, at, um, applying it to healthcare records and to mm -hmm. the library field. But so it's more in use in financial, so it'll be less emerging in the financial industry, but now it's mm -hmm. more emerging in healthcare and in library science. Ah, okay. So that would be one example of that. And so top on the list here, we have unseen social ethical concerns. And that would be, we don't know there's no regulation for this technology yet, even for things like social media and for blockchain, artificial intelligence, and pretty much anything that has emerging in front of it. It's building too quickly and being developed too quickly for government regulations and other regulatory mm -hmm. authorities to catch up with. Yeah. So right now the users and the creators are building their own regulation. And then we have to ask ourselves as consumers, can we trust the regulation that was built by the creator? Self-regulation is always a slippery slope. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so the more we know about this technology and how it works, the more we can look at it and say, this is what I'd like to see out of this technology. This is why it's working. This is why it's not working. And then as libraries, the more information we can give to our patrons, the more they can take control of the information age and the more they can take a hand in policy building. Mm -hmm. Because once we have a true understanding of what all of this stuff is, the more we can go to our government agencies and our political agencies and our tech agencies and say, this is working for me. This mm -hmm. isn't working for me. This is going to have horrible consequences in society. This is going to have amazing consequences in society. Mm -hmm. And then this information and this knowledge is our power. Yes, I was going to say empower the people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And next up is limitation to particular countries. Mm -hmm. And for this one, um, I'll go back to the example of social media. Right now, social media is not used and it's not accessible in the same way every, in every country. Mm -hmm. So in, for example, in China, they can't access Facebook in the same way that we can here. Right. And there's more, there's <clears throat> different regulation in, in other countries and there's different regulation here where there's no regulation. And right now, social media is supposed to be our way to interact with each other and interact with other parts of the world and mm -hmm. learn more about other parts of the world. And not everyone in the world has access to it. Mm -hmm. Not everyone in the world has access to the same information. And we'll see that that cost at the bottom, that is one of the big way, biggest ways that this emerging technology is expanding the gap. So all this technology, it needs a research and development time. Research and development mm. takes funding, it takes money, it takes talent, it takes effort, it takes time. And I've worked in libraries for my entire life. I've never had time as a librarian. <laughs> you know? No. And then bouncing. I think all of us can identify with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. And then that's why a lot of this emerging tech is largely seeming to come out of academic libraries too, because in our in a public library mission statement, you never see dive into the great unknown. <laughs> like you see it more in academic libraries because it's. Mm -hmm. They're the leading force that's diving in to find out what's going on, keep on top of the trends, and they put the funding toward the research. And then there's also the lack of investigation and research. Investigation and research, we all know is huge in libraries, but since this technology is still being created, there hasn't been time or there hasn't been enough widespread information about a technology that's currently being created for us to be able to go through and do our due diligence to mm -hmm. find out if it's working, if it's not working. And there hasn't been enough time that has passed to find out, to do a long-term study to find out if any of this is impacting people. Um, I'll go back to the example of social media again here because we all use it and it's probably one of the more universal examples. Mm -hmm. And it's that right now we're using social media to connect to the world, but we don't know how forming a, digi a digital identity is going to impact us over time. We don't know what kind of psychological, long-term psychological effects that's going to have connecting with someone over a computer instead of face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what that's going to have on what impact that's going to have on relationships. Um, you have social media in terms of friendships. You have social media in terms of online dating, mm -hmm. and we don't know what the long-term effect of that is going to be. But more people are going to be trying it, and then there, in the future, there will be more studies that will determine the long-term impact. So yes, social media has been around for decades now. But there's still a lot we don't know about. Yeah, it. people are using it, and it's it, people are using it for all those things. But yeah. it's not really long enough. I mean, we've got the anecdotal information that people are, you know, getting married based on people they yeah. meet online and having friendships that they consider are just as strong as an in-person one. It's it's all about the conversation. But 50 years from now, 100, you know, when you've got the next generation, and how does that all? There's yeah. a lot to do. And the, wish I could be around to see what, how this does all come out. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I'd love yeah. to know, like, in 100 years, how did this all really affect things? Are teenagers still communicating by emoji? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one I'll cover is the network effect. Technology is only as powerful as the number of people that adopt that technology. Mm -hmm. So you can have something amazing that's put together that no one adopts because, one, they don't understand it or two, it just doesn't seem applicable to them. Mm -hmm. And, 
or you can have technology that's picked up in an instant and then is it good is it bad who's to say so many failed dot coms yeah. out there that yeah. you've heard of and used and you're like oh, i remember that one yeah and it's not around it i thought it was great at the time but yeah it didn't stick and then once this technology is created can it stand the test of time and that's why this emerging technology there won't be a standard definition for it for a very long time because as we can see this is Gartner's hype cycle. Um, Gartner mm -hmm. is one of their leading tech industries that are doing scientific research and my favorite part of this little chart is the trial of disillusionment. <laughs> uh -huh. As this company, they go through a year by year and they study different trends and cycles just across industries. They find out what is growing rapidly, what has a lot of hype around it, what's probably just vaporware, which is probably never going to be in creation, mm -hmm. and what will actually stand through the test of time. So I'm going to be looking a lot at the trial of disillusionment and the slope of enlightenment like later on the second half of that chart to find out what will probably be more applicable to libraries and what will be more low cost currently to be able to use. Mm -hmm. So this is a chart that text is probably a little too small for people to read on the screen or just a little blurry. When you get the slides, you'll be able to see what all these were. So, yeah. yeah, get more into it. So this is just for 2018. Wow. And I did not count how many are on this chart right now, but there's quite a few as you can see. So right down in the trial of disillusionment is augmented reality. It's mm -hmm. mixed reality. So that is actually going to be one of the ex major examples of what libraries can use right now because there's more free apps that are out right now, more people, more companies are trying to get people to adopt their technology. Mm -hmm. So they made more free resources to bring people in. And there's more tutorials and of course Google's all over it yeah. because they're Google. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so you can see those little yellow triangles on there. The chart mm -hmm. says that that is going to take more than 10 years for that technology to develop. Uh -huh. So autonomous driving cars, like what Elon Musk was working on, mm -hmm. that is, it's going to take some time. And that also means that that level of time means that the people that are, we're teaching in schools right now are soon going to be the ones developing the technology right that's on this chart. When they get out of school. Yeah. yeah. And that means that our digital, digital literacy efforts and technology efforts that part of what we're doing is going towards this cycle. Mm -hmm. Very important to it. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. so let's move forward here. I covered a lot about social media and I chose this slide because it looks like chaos. Because <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So right now we're tracking more or less what currently exists in social media and then in libraries we're talking about how to teach it so i found that what's more important is not how you use one single piece of social media like not how you use facebook or how you use pinterest it's how you connect mm -hmm. in general and if you can build just a, an across the board regulation in your library for the most ethical use for technology, for this social media technology, that is almost better than what you can do for using one at a time. Because in the future, we don't know how many other types of social media there are going to be. Mm -hmm. Look how quickly these all cropped up. Mm -hmm. And if we try to tackle them one at a time, you we won't spend too much time on the, like, it on the details. And then there's things like um, looking at this slide and all these icons. For example, right there center, Google Plus. No longer. They're shutting it down. Yeah. I've got my email, I think April or something. There's yeah. an official date. Yeah. So already that one is gone. And they shut gone. it down for consumers, but for businesses, it'll mm. still exist. Yeah. But 
but then you won't have your patrons coming in and saying, yeah, I want to use my Google Plus account to connect and talk to so and so. It's just not, yeah, it didn't do so well. It certain yeah. people, like you're saying, it was the disillusionment. I think it just that's where it ended. Uh, yeah. Certain people connected with it and used it, and not enough did and just didn't do what people wanted yeah. to. Really, I guess is what just what people thought it would do. And that's actually one of the traits that we have to teach our students and our patrons is failure is inevitable. Mm -hmm. But Google's not going to stop. Oh no! Like they're Google's going to be. Right. That's a blip on their radar. Yeah. And that is probably a little later on. We'll talk about the different personal characteristics that will help people thrive in a world of technology. And thriving in the face of failure is one of them. Because we're gonna, like, you're gonna see startups that rise up and just plummet down. Mm -hmm. Like, they devote years and years of their time and energy. And even on this chart, people are going to devote years and years and years and hours of effort into this. And it may not happen. No. But odds are pretty good. They'll try something new. Yeah, let's move on to something. They'll use that information and that experience for one of the other yeah. things. Yeah. And so I covered a lot of this in my previous examples, so I won't kind of beat it's it to death simple, right yeah. now. So I'm actually just going to skip over this part because I use a lot of these examples already, and there's only so much time in the day. <laughs> Virtual reality. Um, we did not see this in the trial of disillusionment, but it was in the trial a few years ago mm. because virtual reality has actually been around for quite some time. Sure. And it just exploded in popularity recently. So it was right around the time that Facebook picked up Oculus Rift and mm. they bought it for almost $2 billion. And that's right around the time that the virtual reality boom happened. So mm -hmm. what is virtual reality, for one thing? Um, it is immersing people in a full-on 3D environment. And I've seen it done well, and I've seen it done not so well. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things, like there's a few different ways that VR is trying to work out the kinks right now. And one is the field of view. If you mm -hmm. turn, if you keep your head straight forward and then move your eyes left or right, try to imagine the degree of field of view that you have just normally in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And it's usually about, if I remember right, it's about 180, between 180 and mm -hmm. 210 if you were to turn your head physically. That headset, the Oculus Rift, is about 110 degrees mm. and that means that your You're brain is yourself. used to getting that degree of rotation something's missing right and now your virtual reality is trying to trick people into thinking that they're immersed in another world you need that and your brain is like way. something's not quite right here <laughs> yeah, yeah. And field of view isn't, it's not the only thing that VR is trying to work out the kinks of, but that's all I'm going to cover right now because that's a whole other presentation. Sure. So how is VR still emerging? Um, one, we don't know how addictive virtual reality is going to be. Mm. And until we find that out, we won't know what the social and ethical implications of that VR is. And we also, until we find out all the different applications that the different fields find for VR, we also won't know what the ethical implications are. So since this is still in development, our regulation is still in development and our ethics are still in development. And right now, the there's a cheap way to make VR and there's an expensive way to make VR. Mm -hmm. Oculus Rift, Super expensive. <laughs> yeah. Like if you're using Unity or something like that, there's a cheaper way to do it. And then there's building a team of 20 different people, getting different artists, getting a script writer, getting yeah. like mm -hmm. everything under the sun and building a team to make this. It takes time. It takes energy. It takes effort. And it still may not work. And then... 
usually the most successful ones I've seen, they found a niche environment. Hmm. And so they've driven straight toward education or they like there's a chem lab app that has been gaining more popularity because they use pedagogical practices hmm. to build this app. And then they've also used um, so when you put this headset on and you're in this virtual reality world, you need something that'll tell you where to turn your head. And you need like an indicator on the screen, whether it's an arrow or whether it's an object that's half on the screen, half off, that tells you, I need to turn here to get more information. So you're in court. So in just that one app, you're incorporating pedagogical practices because it's an educational tool, but then you're also pairing with someone who knows art and you're pairing someone who knows psychology because you need to know what people look for in the real world to gain more information and what it's, motivates to learn. There's so many things in the real world that you just don't think about. Right. That you need yeah. to duplicate in something like this. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have to know shading techniques and 3D modeling techniques to be able to replicate the real world enough to know, to tell the user whether it's night or day, or if you're in like a scary environment or if you're in a happy peppy unicorn environment. <laughs> and so basically these teams, uh, this technology is getting more complex. And we also have to teach people how to work in partnerships and how mm. to not just think in one field. So mm. in that example of virtual reality, I already talked about um, education. I talked about psychology, uh, 3D modeling, and there's script writing basically for a good VR game. You have to be able to build a story. Mm -hmm. No one just wants to walk, to walk into a 3D environment and say, well, I'm here now. <laughs> you know, they, they won't stay. They won't keep the, head, no. the headset on. So, and there's a lot more than just those little strains that go into building a really good game or a really good environment. Yeah, some of these games, I mean, this is, a lot of this has is very similar to video game development. Yeah, a yeah, lot of and it. the ones that do really well have that story. It's not just walk in and kill all the bad yeah. guys or kill the aliens or something. Um, I mean, Final Fantasy is huge mm -hmm. for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's RPG. It's it's a story. Yeah. Um, um, Gears of War is a game yeah. that my husband plays, and he it's it's a first person shooter. It's you're just shooting the aliens and it's military, big buff military, men and women and whatnot. But the story behind that, he was literally in tears more than once because of the story just being so heart wrenching. Yeah. You know, of what was happening to the, the the soldiers and the people and if it wasn't that it would just be eh, shoot yeah. all the aliens and it wouldn't be nearly as, you know, yeah. Yeah. Good times. Yes. You know? <laughs> he enjoyed it though in the end. Yeah. Yes, it was yes. <laughs> But and that's and you need the same thing. Yeah, it's yeah. not you can't just you can't just yeah half ass it. <laughs> yeah. And what I'm getting at and like what we need to teach in libraries and what we need for 21st century skills, think mm -hmm. across the board. Like a lot of this technology was made because people talk to each other. They got inspired by other fields. Um, they got inspired by. Uh, if you think about robot design, half of it's animal inspired. Animal oh, yeah. locomotion mm -hmm. and biomechanics. It's all the creepiest all... ones are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. Or the most awesome. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But moving on. So I already talked about a few ways that VR can be used and how it can be taught. Mm -hmm. Because in the library, the future information needs are going to be that People are interested in how technology works, but they also technology can also be used as a teaching tool. Mm -hmm. It can be used to help library services expand. It can be used to help library buildings and buildings improve. Um, it can be used to. It's pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. 
but and it can also so VR can be used to help improve exposure to your library so you can build a virtual reality tour and in the handout I actually have an example of a Google actually made a new tutorial that will it's free to use and they have a full-on step-by-step tutorial mm -hmm. that'll show you how to take a 360 camera and capture footage of your library and capture footage of the surrounding area mm. and you'll be able to you can create a VR tour nice. which is really cool you've seen lots of those kind of video tours online but sometimes it's like the next level <laughs> yeah and then one thing to keep in mind when you're building these new virtual reality tools that headset that he's wearing that Vive mm -hmm. It's more expensive. Yeah, that's it's, the thing too. Yeah. The tools. Now you were talking about the the costs from the really expensive ones, but there's also the Google I think the cardboard. Google the cardboard. Yeah. yeah, your cell phone in this cardboard contraption. Yeah, that is the cheapest thing. All you do yeah. is you, you don't fun. even yeah you just get the design, take a piece of cardboard, fold it the right way yeah. to hold your cell phone, and you've made your own. Yeah. You don't even actually need to buy that from the store. There's plans online. No, yeah, that's own, what I was saying. Yeah, is, find yeah. a plan, find a piece of cardboard. <laughs> and cardboard, so that Vive there, that uses a Fresnel lens, and the car, the Google Cardboard uses a biconvex lens, so that when you're looking through those lenses, you're not actually seeing one image. You're seeing two images side by side. Oh. And it uses stereopsis. Like those stereotypic th pictures from yeah. way back. Yeah. Yes. The stereo viewer, it's yes. like, that was actually the evolution of virtual reality. So I love that, those things. Yeah, they're <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And I actually also put a link to the history of virtual reality in the handout. And you can show, like, that's also a great way to even just put together a program in the library. Sure. Yeah. Is to grab one of those stereo viewers and then grab a Google Cardboard and show a picture of how the inside of a, the cell phone, what that image looks like when you're not looking at it through those Fresnel lens. Well, cardboard uses biconvex, but, mm. and Oculus Rift uses the hybrid Fresnel lenses, which is a whole other animal. Mm. But, I won't go. I, I'm fascinated with Fresnel <laughs> lenses, if you hadn't noticed. So I'm trying not to go on a tangent right now. Yeah, what? But I don't even know what those are. Fresnel it's, lenses, it's a. She asked. Quick. She <laughs> asked. Just when well, you're yeah. mentioning it, I'm sure other people might be wondering. Just a short, yeah. picky version. So Fresnel lenses, it's a series of concentric circles that when you look through the lens, it will converge light inwards. Hmm. So when okay. you have it one in front of each eye, it converges light inwards and directs your, it merges those two images into a single image. Hmm. Okay, cool. Quickie version. Yeah. Yeah. And where was I? Okay. Uh, so you can use those to build your virtual environment and then you can build your own headset using cardboard and two stick-on biconvex lenses that you can order in bulk from Amazon for like five bucks. Nice. And so you can show kids how to build their own headset and then how to build their own app. Mm -hmm. So you can actually have That's a great older, program, yeah. Yeah. You can have adults building that. You can build it yourself. Um, Google made it so that high schoolers or even sixth to eighth grade to make could make that. So you could have older adults or kids making this. I'm a big kid now. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can show younger kids how to build the headset. And then one, it doesn't take any of the library. It doesn't have to take any librarian time because you can use library programming to have older kids make it or adults make it and then have the, ki the kids make their own headset and then do the tour of your library or the tour of a school or the tour of anything mm -hmm. and use that to teach people how it works and then use that to gain exposure to your library and to then you can post mm -hmm. this virtual tour on your library website and mm -hmm. on different technology forums sure. and that's a great way to show that the your library is changing for the future and that your library is prepared for the future 
and you are who people should go to to learn more about these things. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so you covered how you can expose library patrons to emerging tech because they would be they would basically be building emerging tech. They wouldn't be um, coding it from scratch, but they would be going through the motions to find out how it's designed and made. And then you can also create other virtual reality environments to, you can even build a virtual reality. Actually, that's better for augmented reality. <laughs> I'll just skip ahead here. Sure. Augmented reality. So in the picture here, you can see someone's holding a tablet. Mm. And augmented reality, the apps work by using a camera and sensors to collect information from the environment. So right now that camera is focused on that physical object of that anatomy. Mm -hmm. And once the, the app takes in that information and then you can program that app to label different features on it. So right there it's showing where the right lung is and the left lung and that other labels off the screen, but you have the idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is also a, it could be the potential for a vocational training tool oh, yeah. or for like, for example, if you think of the different roles in your library that have a lot of revolving doors. Mm -hmm. So shelvers in a lot of cases because yeah. they go off to school or they, shelvers, yeah. Pages, yeah. yeah. So you can program an augmented reality app that would be able to, you could hand your shelver a tablet, they could walk through the library, and then they could hold it up over key different areas that you have physically marked in your library, and they can learn more information and learn how to do their job differently. And teach them how call numbers work. Yeah, that's the hardest great. thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you can use this app for learning through repetition because mm -hmm. no one ever learns anything on the first try. It takes a while. Mm -hmm. So they can take this tablet and instead of going and finding you and asking you, then they can ask the app instead. Mm -hmm. They can hold up the tablet and say, oh, that's right. The that's thing I can't remember yeah. what it was when yeah. they taught it to me last week. Oh, yeah. that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And then when the, when the shelver does go to ask you questions, you can take note of the questions that they asked and then you can program that to into your app. Mm -hmm. And Metaverse is actually a free app that you can use to either build a library tour or to build something like this. And that's also in the handout that I put up on there so that you, you don't have to jot that down, it's on there. And so right now, augmented okay. reality, yeah, that's my favorite. Yeah. You know? People I've run into walls phone. doing that. <laughs> my husband fell down and skinned his knee. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to share that. No. But yeah. <laughs> Don't tell him I told you. <laughs> so speaking of social ethical implications, we don't know how people are going to react when they're fully immersed in this augmented environment. So Pokemon Go is, it's actually an awesome experiment. Mm -hmm. because it uses uh, it uses a set of sensors that are inside your phone to track where your current location is. And that's it's basically like a, the same sensors that are used in GPS location. And once the app registers that you've hit a specific location, it pops a Pokemon up on your screen. And then you got to catch them all. Mm -hmm. And this is how people run into poles, how they've walked into traffic, how they walked into places they're probably not supposed mm. to go. So this is how we're finding out the hard way what the safety and what how our policy should go in the creation of these augmented reality apps. So when you're showing patrons how to use Pokemon Go, it's an awesome way to find out how augmented reality works but then after the session, start, start asking them more questions. Ask them what was, the, what was going on in the world around them when they were staring down at their screen. And how much 
were you a actually able to register in the real world while you were immersed in this mixed reality world? If there, if someone was mugging someone across the street, would they have noticed? Mm -hmm. And then the other question is, how can they take these concerns and take them to a regulatory agency? How can we as consumers take control of this augmented reality world? How can we take control of how this world is being shaped? Because we're going to be living in this world. We should have some say in what's going on with it. Mm -hmm. And this isn't just true with augmented reality. It's true with artificial intelligence. It's true with virtual reality and blockchain and everything that we're going to encounter. The more we know, the more we can do to tell, to say, remember that network effect? Technology is only as powerful as what gets adopted. Mm -hmm. If we find out that something isn't safe, no matter how fun it is or how popular it is, we can band together to shut it down. It's not going to stick around. Yeah. yeah. And so Pokemon Go, awesome. <laughs> What's going to happen in five, ten years? Well, Will it we'll still see. be there? Will people still be running into polls? <laughs> <laughs> will it have some other, will it have evolved into something new? Yeah. Yeah. And Pokemon Go may very well say, like, oh, yeah, that probably wasn't the greatest idea. We're going to tweak this, this, and this. And now there's an arrow pointing to the pole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so possibilities. And that is something that you're talking about having control over, that they have given people, and this, I mean, this is a good example of um, them some control. There are places where you have stops and gyms to battle in and certain um, organizations, locations have said, no, we don't want one at our space, right. at our location, mm -hmm. because too many people are coming here and it's causing problems. Yeah. So they can reach out to the developers of Pokemon Go and say, please remove us from your system as a official spot to go to. Yeah. Or the opposite, we want to be added. Yeah. There is an option to do that. So you, we do have, for, and it, they've started getting some of that control offering that some of that control developers of Pokemon go to people in businesses or libraries who say we want to bring in people and have an event. So can you make us one of those official spots for people to go to for things and get added to the game? Yeah. So, um, or we just there take things. pillows to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> That's a thought. Yeah. And then when you invest in bubble wrap, right? Yeah. And, and if you're, when you're taking your control over all of this emerging tech, when you take one thing away, try to find a safer replacement option. So there's a million and one apps that are out there right now. So if you have to tell your patrons, I'm sorry, but we can't use Pokemon Go anymore, find a different one. There could be something else. Yeah. Pokemon Go, the main danger point is that you have to move through more of the environment to be able to engage with the app. But there are other apps where you don't have to actually move so much in the environment. If you build your own app in the library, mm. and uh, there's that metaverse that I was talking about for virtual reality. Um, I lied, metaverse is actually more for augmented mm -hmm. reality. Um, it's, you can trigger a zombie apocalypse in your library awesome yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you can also trigger without the mess because it's yeah. all yeah. augmented reality <laughs> yeah no core cleanup it's, it's a plus <laughs> yeah but so you have control over your own library environment you know which areas in your library pose the most danger for different age ranges and you can also control if patrons are going into a certain area of your library. Mm -hmm. You can even hold an event after hours. Yeah. And this is a great way for you to know that, one, you have control over your environment, over your own environment. And then you also know that if you test it both ways, having your app running during hours and then having people run into other patrons while they're staring at their screen, mm -hmm. then you know that that is a policy recommendation that you can make to regulatory authorities in the future that apps 
like that you can take that the users should have to be able to take control of their environment for this to be a safe app to use. And if you look at um, its arc, um, Google, Google again, <laughs> um, they made another, they're making best practices for augmented reality. And one of the best practices is for the app developers to make a rule book for users for how to set up the best environment to use their augmented reality app within. And that's something that Google's already learned because they've been doing it. But we also don't want to just trust the creator. We want to know more, experiment more, learn more, teach more, so we can have control ourselves. And so I've already gone over how AR can be used with Metaverse making a tour. You can you make like a an AR tour. Um, you can use AR. You can use augmented reality to show your library patrons other parts of the world. Um, there are virtual reality expeditions and there are AR expeditions made by Google to do tours around the world. Um, BBC is making a, an, a new app that will let you explore different historical sites and different museum exhibits. Um, right now they're still in, they're gathering feedback from their users to find out if they want to continue it or if they want to change it or adapt it. And gathering feedback from users is probably one of the best things that app developers can do right now and what you can do as your library too. Find out what people want, find out mm -hmm. how it worked for them, find out what they're experimenting with. And a lot of this tech industry is just going to be trying new stuff, breaking it, find out why mm -hmm. it broke and try to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> that's what's in creating technology, that's what's in using technology, and that's what's in creating the regulatory policies that's going to control technology in the future. Speaking of the future, <laughs> right now there are a lot of academic libraries that are exploring emerging technology and finding out how they can directly apply it to the library. Mm -hmm. Blockchain is probably one of the bigger ones because San Jose recently had the, they did a one year long experiment and to find out how this technology is being applied. And it recently just culminated in a class that I just, um, so I'm involved in this company, in this organization called Code for Live. Mm -hmm. Code for Live, yeah, you probably I know, know. Yeah. 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 So. I'm, I signed up for their newsletter and I just got through the news chain that San Jose is putting out their, they built like this little instructional course. Hmm. It's an informational course that shows people what blockchain is and what their findings are. And they put together, it's basically a training session to show librarians how blockchain can be taught and in the library, used in the library, how we can provide information to patrons, different things like that. Um, that's what I got from their website when I checked it out. And I'm sure there's more to it. I haven't attended the class yet, but stay tuned. And so generically, what is blockchain? It's a, you can see on the bottom, a secure way to collect and store data. Originally used in uh, Bitcoin, it was made by a, it's either an individual or a group of people because they published their white paper under a pseudonym. Ah. So we actually have no idea who ah. the person is, pe person or people are. But that didn't stop us from using it. No. <laughs> um, there was a hesitation to use it because why would we want to use technology from someone who doesn't even want to admit who they are? And that was that's one of like the biggest question marks for blockchain is who are these who people? are these people mm -hmm. transparency and transparency and technology is probably one of the most important awesome things that you can find and you'll find that more when we get to artificial intelligence but why is blockchain still emerging one we don't really fully know 
one, what it is, two, how it can be applied. Uh, we know that blockchain itself is, you can, it's called blockchain because it's basically a chain of blocks. Each block represents a set of data. And when one block is added, then it's automatically linked on to a next block of related data that's placed into an overall network. Those two blocks are connected by an encryption key. This encryption key is supposed to have really high security. That means that no one is able to hack into it, but I'm pretty sure we've heard that before, <laughs> where yes. a company will say, this is the most amazing unhackable thing that you will ever, we were just hacked. And so we don't know if these claims are true. We, I don't have a full understanding of it. I've never made blockchain. And even the people who are creating blockchain. Someone will figure out a way to yeah, hack it, but yeah. it's all le le levels of what is, <sighs> nothing is ever going, as far as, I mean, I'm saying something potentially controversial. I don't, nothing is ever going to be unhackable. I don't yeah. think that anybody, it's just like saying the Titanic is an unsinkable ship. Just don't say those things. Yeah. Because somebody will do something. You could say it is resistant, the most resistant to yeah. so far. Yeah. Because as we're innovating with technology, someone's going to find hackers out some are way. innovating too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we also don't know. So the other part of blockchain is that it's supposed to be decentralized. Right. So it does not, the information does not have to pass through a central authority. Um, in the case of the original use of blockchain with cryptocurrency, most transactions that you use for a credit card or something like that, it would have to pass through a financial institution. Blockchain doesn't. It actually goes through a network. You can see on that diagram on there. It's actually a network of computers that are synced together that the, that transaction passes through. Um, it's authorized by a set of algorithms that are made by the developer or developing team that place out a set of criteria that this transaction is placed through to find out, one, if it's coming from a legitimate source or if you have enough funds for it, if you have it, it's their set of criteria. Mm. And I don't want to just use cryptocurrency as an example here because you can also use it for records. For data. That's it's just any yeah. set of data. So, and that's one of the biggest confusion points of blockchain. One of the major examples that people use to teach blockchain is cryptocurrency, but that's not the only application. Mm. It's kind of gotten siloed into that because that's how people most people think about it, but it's just sets of data. It Don't think of it as cryptocurrency. And on your computers and the internet, it's just data. It's just yeah. packets of information. So yeah. You could use it, it for anything. Yeah. Yeah. And guess who uses data? <laughs> totally. <laughs> 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 but we also don't know how secure this really is. And we don't have any regulation for how these systems are currently set up. Mm -hmm. So since this is still in creation, we don't know. There would need to be a really high level of transparency with the development team. And if libraries were to use this, we would have to know exactly the steps that went into creating the algorithms that set the criteria for how this data is used and find out who has access to this data. And there's supposed to, in order to access the blockchain and to make changes to a blockchain, you're supposed to have an authorization key. Hmm. But who sets who's going to get this authorization key? Mm -hmm. If we make a really wide network of blockchain that's used across libraries, like it could be used na like nationally or globally, but do we want to? Yeah. And what kind of security risk is this going to have? Who has authorization to access it? Who can change it? Who is measuring, who is tracking the different changes that were made? Uh, what kind of metadata is going to go into this? Like it's going to be a cataloger's dream or a cataloger's <laughs> nightmare. Maybe a bit of yeah. 
But, as cataloging is anyway. <laughs> cheer enough, you know. <laughs> but we don't know the impact this is going to have in any way, shape, or form. And we're just starting mm -hmm. to explore it in the library world. And well, there are open source tools that you can use to find out how blockchain is being used in a corporate environment right now. But one, in order to use that tool, you need to know a whole lot more about blockchain before you can start exploring it. And you're going to break it a lot while you're making it. Mm -hmm. And that's just a thing of life and technology. Mm -hmm. But a lot of this tech, a lot of this explored emerging tech is going to probably get into development and re, like research and development, but it may never get into production. Mm -hmm. Because, and you also have to think about different corporations that are just looking at their bottom line and that they know that they just sunk a whole lot of money into this research and development. So they may look over a few of the ethical concerns before, like without, and they may just kind of gloss those over and just push it into production. Mm -hmm. Because Kind of the catch-22 is that we are not going to know if any of this works until after it's in production. Yeah. So it's kind of a necessary evil to be able to not have all the answers before something gets pushed out into the world. And then it's there. And that's kind of one of the biggest uncertainty factors that goes into emerging technology right now is that we created stuff that we don't fully understand yet. Mm -hmm. And the users don't know, the creators don't know, the creators will probably it's, claim to know. It's all still a work in progress. Yeah. That's yeah. the key. Yeah. And there's also a huge cost to this research and development. Mm -hmm. So a lot of libraries are going to be hesitant to implement blockchain because the changeover for the infrastructure to a library is going to be really expensive. Yeah. I mean, it could have the potential to save costs long term, but we don't know. It's just like making it's a, a switch risk. from one ILS to another one. It's yeah. going to be a huge yeah. undertaking. But yeah. that's that's the idea. Is the end result going to be worth that? That's yeah. what you look at when you make those yeah. kind of changes. So yeah. something to keep an eye on. Yeah. And libraries with emerging technology have not been they're not not that risk like libraries are risk adverse and i mean it's funding it's all mm -hmm. it's funding it's time it's energy and you have to prioritize where you put your time and energy and risky emerging technology just isn't top on the bucket list and i can't blame libraries for that <laughs> Like, I would probably place a priority over teaching library patrons what emerging technology is, changing collection development so that library patrons can learn more about it, and change library patrons to mainly do information blocks about it and to do hands-on activities to find out how to create it at a beginning level rather than using emerging technology in library administration or in your building itself. With the exception of Internet of Things, I would use that now. Yeah. But I, I don't have a slide for Internet of the Things, but if you have a question about it, you know where I am. <laughs> artificial intelligence is the biggie here. Mm -hmm. So artificial intelligence is, there. they have multiple applications. There's just different subsets of it. Um, artificial intelligence manifests itself in different ways, deep learning, machine learning, everything like that. I don't have the time nor the mental energy right now to go into everything with artificial <laughs> intelligence. So I'm just going to use one main example that will probably impact libraries directly. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence is what powers Google search engine. Mm. So the image searches and the uh, regular text searches that you use. If you go to, right now, if you were to go to Google, you were to search for what is artificial intelligence, um, you could search for what is iced tea, <laughs> and it will pop up. Ask yourself a question. 
how is this information organized? If you look at the right hand side of the screen, you'll see a little box that has one or more immediate recommended results. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times you'll see Wikipedia in that recommended result box. Why is it there? Look at how Wikipedia was created itself. It's all open source. Mm -hmm. It's powered by the people. people. Yep. And right now, that it, that has become a huge information source. Google is recommending it as a main information mm -hmm. source and answer to a lot of different questions. But we as information professionals have to ask ourselves, why? What algorithm went into this artificial intelligence search engine result to pull this up? And which factors go into the creation of this artificial intelligence? So this, this search engine is created using a set of, it's a training set. Uh, artificial intelligence learns really similarly to, to the way that people learn. Um, there's a developer that creates an algorithm that in the long run, this algorithm is supposed to continue to write itself based on the information that it learned. And in order to do that, the developer has to set a series of factors that will show the AI what to look for and what kind of weight and emphasis to put on each different factor. Those fact, the different types of factors and the different weights that are placed on these factors are made by a human. And that in itself has a bias. Mm. So since there's no regulatory authority for how these developers are putting this together and what kind of factors they're using. And we as librarians, we know that it's impossible to eliminate bias. Even when we make our own collection development mm -hmm. decisions, there's bias. And then this artificial intelligence, once it's had its little weights and factors, then you have to start feeding it data so that it knows what to read to spit out an output. So for example, if you're building a search engine that's supposed to be able to identify different stop signs, you would have to show this artificial intelligence the different markers to look for when it's trying to identify a stop sign. So you'd have to say, is this eight-sided? Is this red? Does it have a white outline? Is the stop um, in white lettering? And then you have to ask yourself, in the real world, what if a stop sign is dirty? Mm -hmm. What if it's what if it's nighttime? What if it's daytime? And then you have to start feeding this artificial intelligence different data. You have to show it pictures of stop signs in the daytime, at nighttime, dirty stop signs, snow covered stop signs. What mm -hmm. if a stop sign is partially obstructed? And then I use this example for a reason. Because if you think of autonomous cars, mm. how does that car identify a stop sign? How does it know when to stop? It's using artificial intelligence. It's driven by artificial intelligence. So the weights and measures that we're using to build this AI that's, you, that's creating the search engine that's pulling up images of stop signs, it's not going to be the same, but it'll be similar. And that's why autonomous cars are more than 10 years out because artificial intelligence still doesn't know what a stop sign is 100%. Mm -hmm. And if a human can't figure out the full on set of training data that will go into identifying a stop sign, then how will an artificial intelligence that's created by a human know that it's identifying the correct thing and pulling the right data set and outputting the right data? And that's how artificial intelligence is largely being made by right now, but it's not the only way. And now this artificial intelligence is supposed to be creating its own data and its own algorithms to mm -hmm. expand this and say, these are the different trends that I've been taught to look for. This is the way that I've been taught. And now can I continue this pattern to create my, to continue my own self-learning and education? 
it works in a similar way that it's it's an artificial human. Mm -hmm. And then ask yourself another question. We are trusting the information that is generated by this artificial intelligence. We're trusting it because we trust Google. Can we mm -hmm. trust Google? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and this artificial intelligence is going to permeate everywhere. And now as, li as information professionals, as librarians, we now have to show people that when you search something in Google, you will get an immediate and easy answer, but is it the right one? And who is the one who created the artificial intelligence? Which factors did they use? And right now, an algorithm is a black box. If you read that, the dark secret at the heart of AI is that we really don't know what these machines are doing. They are essentially black boxes that be could become an Achilles heel. How do we know the re results are fair or unbiased? Mm -hmm. MIT Tech. So as librarians, one, a lot of us are just wondering what AI is going to do the, to the information profession. Mm -hmm. And two, we have to find ways to keep ahead of it because we can't 100% trust AI unless we know what weights and balances and which factors went into the algorithms and the training sets that taught the AI. Mm -hmm. We don't know which pictures of a stop sign were shown to this artificial intelligence to create it. We don't know if all the different factors were taken into account. And if you now, the next time you see a stop sign, you might think a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> But that's true of all information. Mm -hmm. And what's the authority source? And AI is going to change again. The, the methodology is going to change as they learn more. And this is going to keep going. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be. It's, as I said, we can take control of creation of technology mm -hmm. too. We use artificial intelligence in everything right now, but does everyone know that we're using it? You know, I think of it that way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We just say, here's this cool new thing that we're using. It's easier to find a recipe for lasagna. I do it too. <laughs> I mean, I do. I Oh, sure. Yeah. And but we have to start make, asking these questions. And even if you just pull a group together at the library and do an information session, start getting people talking about it. Find out what people don't understand. Find out what people are afraid of. Find out if those fears are legitimate. And is this something that we can take into our own hands? Can we force a regulation for artificial intelligence that will make these developers have transparency? Mm -hmm. If we refuse to use an artificial intelligence that doesn't reveal the training set information or the factors and weights and balances that went into these to this technology, what can we do? Transparency and technology should walk hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And if we just blindly trust the product of what came out of this and we start adopting it and we start giving this technology power, what's we'll going to happen? We'll end up with Skynet. Pretty much. And yeah. as you said, the previous slide. Yeah. yeah. Apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> we still have the power to, to keep be in control of these yeah. things. Yeah. Just I mean, gotta do it. Yeah. And as you if you remember that chart, AI is still developing. Mm -hmm. They will always constantly be trying to find new ways to apply it. And the library is going to apply it too. Later on down the line there might be a library created search engine 
that has transparent weights and values to it that people can trust more than Google that obscures their algorithms in a black box. And I can understand why they as a corporation would want to do that because they don't want someone to steal their weights and balances. Mm -hmm. And they don't want someone to rep be able to replicate more easily what they're doing. And they've already, Google has already released a portion of what they use for their algorithm for their image. Their image search, it's called TensorFlow. If you go to TensorFlow, Google started building a, it's a set of tutorials that they put together to teach people what machine learning is and what artificial intelligence is. And I mean, I'm sure Google is just trying to generate more talent and recruit more people. That I mean, that could be one of the reasons, but who's to say? But Google prides themselves on transparency. They say, this is what we're doing. We're using your data for this. How many people look at it? Mm -hmm. the you just trust them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people just, it's an easy tool to use, but do we want to take that for granted? And do we want to just trust that what they tell us is true? And as librarians, we also need to protect ourselves too. And we have to raise awareness of what artificial intelligence is. And we have to raise aware, we have to show that the library is still the place to go for information. And we also have to show that libraries can do more than just house books. We all know it's true because we do it every day. But what else is out there? I assume this will be more something we'll talk about more in your next session about the yeah. ethics. Yeah. yeah. And what is our time here? We're about 11.15. Yeah, we're running a little long. Oops. Okay. Well, I'll just skip right there. <laughs> so cybersecurity is going to be continually ongoing, and it's going to be used to support the other emerging technology that we just talked about. So I won't talk too much about that, but we also have to teach it in digital literacy. So mm -hmm. this entire presentation is culminating in digital literacy. Mm -hmm. And this is what everyone is working on in libraries across the world. We're preparing our students and our library patrons for 21st century skills. And there was a report out there that was that said that 67% of jobs won't exist yet. We don't know what don't, they are. Yeah. We don't know what the technology is going to be. We don't know which jobs technology is going to eliminate. And we don't know which jobs technology is going to create. And it's, we just need to know that we have control over what technology is created and spreading information, gathering the correct information is how we gain that control. And starting conversations in the library and showing that the library is tech friendly and that we can be an authority source on this information as well mm -hmm. is where the library of the future is likely going. But since we're a little bit over time there, mm -hmm. I'll just say that we'll dive a lot more into this when we go into the ethics behind technology. Because these mm. questions on here are what patrons need to know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, how can it help me? Why do I care? Why yeah, should I care? Pretty much. I guess. Yeah. And that's nine times out of 10 when I go out to different training events or if I talk to just people anywhere. They say, I don't understand blockchain. I don't understand artificial intelligence. Why do I need to know? Mm -hmm. I'm never going to create it. And my answer is always, but you're going to use it. Right. And it's going to shape the future, and it's going to shape who we are as a society. And technology is going to permeate everything. It already is. It already does. And mm -hmm. that, you know. Mm -hmm. And... People need to know how it can impact them in their profession. You have, li you have library patrons from around the world coming in. And you have library patrons that do everything under the sun. 
you never know if so you're going to have a biologist walk through the door or a psychologist or mm -hmm. something. But if you hold an event and you say, we're going to learn more about technology and we're going to have an open conversation about what this is and what it could mean. You're going to have a full room. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. That is one of the most important things that you can do in your library. You'll be bringing like a diverse group of people together, getting a diverse set of opinions. And that's probably going to be the library of the future. Bring people together. Talk about the future. And I'll end it there and just let you know that next month I'll be talking about the ethics behind this mm -hmm. more so. Right. Is this the last slide in yeah. this position? Okay, yeah. great. All right. <coughs> have some tea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so does anybody have any questions um, that you want to have anything um, more explained or any comments? Go ahead and type it in, in the question section. As we mentioned, we did run a little long today, but that's no problem. We go as long as is needed to get things covered when we're doing these kind of things. Um, I think this is great. Um, lots of uh, Good information, good information, scary information in some cases, but um, things that we do need to be, you know, paying attention to, I think, and um, is a great overview of what's going on. There is so much going on. It's, it is hard to just, yeah. but it's something to be good to be aware of and to look for those different things that you're talking about. There's the features of that um, criteria that make something emerging yeah. and um, keep an eye on it and get involved. Um, thank you. Very informative. Yes. <laughs> um, so as I said, we will have the slides available. We'll have the handout available for you when the archive is late, is available. And what I think we'll do now is if we uh, move out of this and over to our website here. Um, there we go. I'm going to go to our Encompass Live website. If you go to the Library Commission's webpage, and I'll see it at Nebraska.gov, or if you just Google, go ahead and type in Encompass Live. So far, if you Google us, search us in your search engine of choice, we're the only thing called that, <laughs> um, Encompass Live. So you'll find our website. Uh, our follow-up session for this one, as I said, I hope you join us for that, will be March 13th, right here, Ethics Behind Emerging Technology. So if you want to continue the conversation that we started here and hear the next Part about it, go ahead and register for that. Um, then we'll have both of those archives up there later. Uh, so thank you so much, Amanda, for starting us off on this, and we'll see you again next month <laughs> and Sounds possibly like things plan. in the future. I wrote myself a note about Code for Live, maybe some other things. Oh, yeah. We'll see. <laughs> um, but here is our schedule for our upcoming Encompass Live shows. I hope you join us next week when our topic is, you know, obviously come back with us for the continuing talking about the merging technology. But next week we're talking about crafting relevant community partnerships using archives. Um, Amy Schindler and um, Lorinda Weiss from um, two of our University of Nebraska campuses here, one in Omaha and one in, in, and Lorinda's in Kearney, um, talk about oral history projects, um, archives and oral histories and using them to connect with your community. There's a bunch of different oral history projects that both of the campuses have put together and they're going to talk about those and how um, they were done and how can you can use those to connect more in with your community. So please do sign up and join us for that. And any of our other shows that we have coming up on here, we've got our March and April sessions on here. We'll have more being added to it. Um, Encompass Live is also on Facebook. If you are a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. There it is. Um, we post reminders. Here's a reminder to log into today's show. When our archives are available, we post on here. No, I don't want to log in right now. Thank you. Um, there. There we go. Recording of last week's show. So um, if you do like to use Facebook, please do give us a like over there. Um, the archive of today's show will be available probably by the end of the day today, as long as everything cooperates with me. It goes right here in our archives at the bottom of our upcoming uh, shows. And the most recent ones are at the top of the list. So here's the one from last week. This week's will be there. It will have a link to the slides in the Google Slides, and the handout will be there for you. Um, everyone who attended this morning and who registered, pre-registered for today's show will get a message from me. And then we will post it also to our social media, our Facebook page, Twitter, the usual places. Uh, while I'm here, I'll tell you, this is our archives for the entire history of Encompass Live. We started the show in January 2009, so we're 10 years in, more than 10 years in now. Um, you can search all of our archives or just the recent, most recent 12 months. 
please note everything has a date on it though so do pay attention when you're looking at something in here some of our shows are going to have old information outdated information um, expired websites services or products don't exist anymore but we are librarians this is what we do we archive things <laughs> so we have everything going back in, in time here so just pay attention to the date of when something was broadcast live when you are searching our archives um, one last thing I do want to mention to everyone um, let's see the best way to get there. We do have coming up at the end of this month our Big Talk from Small Libraries annual conference. This is the registration for that. But um, this is our small and rural libraries across the country doing presentations for us. One day free online event and um, February 22nd. So please do register for that. We have our full schedule up here now and we have presentations from public libraries from schools, from universities. There is a noontime lightning round with five quick 10 minute sessions um, happening. So please, registration is currently open and it is, as I said, on the, always is on the last Friday of February. This is our um, eighth, I was trying to remember, eighth, um, Big Talk from Small Libraries session conference. We have our previous conferences over here in an archive as well. So uh, sign up for Big Talk, sign up for Encompass Live, uh, and hopefully we'll see you at both of those um, events. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for being here with us, Amanda. And we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. And no camera.